All right, what's up, guys? It's Coach Gaglione here. This is another edition of the Powerlifting for the People podcast. We got uh, Dr. Albury here today. How you doing? What's going on? All right, so um, I want to uh, maybe just uh, introduce you real quick. Maybe just tell the people listening or watching, like just who you are and just what you got going on right now, and then we'll kind of uh, rewind a little bit and maybe tell our backstory a little bit. But what do you got going on right now? What do you do? And uh, I'm a I'm a physical therapist, and uh, my background's in exercise science. So um, you know, I'm a strength coach. I get people strong, get people moving better. Um, we're in my facility here, which is like an 1800 square foot gym. So when people come for quote unquote physical therapy, they're coming, you know, let's say someone had a total knee replacement. We're talking about, we might do some traditional things, but if you were to, if you were to be a fly on the wall here, everybody I see it's, you know, it's like an exercise training session if they don't train as well. Cool. So, um, you know, my, my background, like I said, is exercise science and my degree is a doctor of physical therapy degree. But what I probably use more than anything else is um, like exercise prescription knowledge and, and, uh, and to be honest is getting people stronger. Most people that think they have mobility problems, right. they're typically stability problems and that's something we'll, we'll probably talk about. And, and really just finding what, what I think I'm best at is finding out what the actual problem is mm -hmm. and then figuring out is it a medical fix or is it a fitness fix? Yeah. And depending on who refers me, like if you refer me somebody, I know their fitness is taken care of, so then I can just work on medical. And then, you know, I get yeah. a bunch of people from, you know, a couple different equinoxes. You know, we kind of like co-treat people, for lack of better terms. But um, part of it from a business strategy is I get somebody who has an actual medical issue, and I transfer them in the fitness so I can keep them in the door. And now I'm in the process of bringing some other services in sure. to keep them in the door for longer. Cool. You know, to kind of stretch their, their dollar a little bit further. So I think uh, one thing that's, uh, I just want to kind of harp on quick too, which I think is great, is that, you know, you're really good at like kind of assessing what the problem is and figuring out what the actual problem is. I know I get um, a lot of injury questions a lot. And, you know, for me, like that's like, you know, I'm a strength coach first. And while I do have some knowledge and I've had some things, I can only really talk about like my experience and what, my, you know, athletes have experienced and, uh, you know, my, and myself and Dr. Albert, we have a good relationship. So if someone is like really banged up and I really can't kind of figure out the problem or if it's like kind of out, out of my scope, it's getting to the point where like I'm not playing coach anymore. Cause I think a lot of uh, personal trainers and stuff, they try and play doctor and like, that's not a good idea. So we have a good relationship and I think it's good. Uh, if you are a coach that's listening, that you find someone in your area that you can kind of hook up with, that you can kind of communicate with. Cause I think that's, uh, I don't think we uh, do as much collaboration as we should. Uh, especially with people like in the area. So if you're in per and whether you're an in-person coach, you do online coaching, I think it's really important to have those people like in your network that you can kind of bounce ideas off of and refer refer out when needed. Uh, but the, the main thing also, I think it's important. I think a lot of times when it comes to mobility and stretching and all this stuff, and we'll talk a little bit more about your philosophy and your approach to that, I think it's important that, you know, a lot of people kind of, you know, I think Greg Cook's the first person to use the analogy. We, we throw grenades, right? We kind of just yeah. like carpet bomb. Try around. like a bunch of stuff and we just don't even know. But be, you want to have more of a sniper approach if you have some sort of assessment process uh, and then kind of go from there. I know like we do some. And if I'm like kind of struggling with somebody, we have a couple of quick, you know, just a little general movement assessments that we do. And obviously watching the movement and we can kind of pinpoint those things pretty quick. And I know that you have a process and we'll talk about that. But before we talk about the technical stuff, um, I want to rewind a little bit. So, uh, can you just give us a little bit of background about like, you know, you know, you were an athlete growing up. I know when we first met, we were actually, uh, <laughs> training at a commercial gym. Oh, there was a lot of, cr cr a it was pretty, pretty fun, fun, a fun crazy fun, time. Fun, fun gym. And, and, and why, the reason why we stopped training at that gym, <laughs> the reason why everyone stopped training is for another. Yeah. It's, we want to put that on the public uh, yeah, yeah, for another For thing. sure. <laughs> It's the, after, person, the after specific hour. person. Yeah, the after hours edition. <laughs> the booze, but, the um, booze session. <laughs> uh, but in you know, we it was pretty cool. You know, it's especially uh, so. Man, this is probably you know seven plus years ago. It's, been, it's been I moved a, down been, to Long Island in two thousand and nine, and it would be two thousand and nine. So I know that two thousand nine, two thousand ten. Uh, I was competing in strongman. Yeah. Um, I after I played football growing up, basketball, and then I had my. Um, when I got into weightlifting, my dad was a was a power lifter, and he was a bench guy. Um, where to, he will never admit this. Right? <laughs> and he'll never see this either. So, doesn't matter. <laughs> um, but his pull in his squat was was below his bench. He was like a guy that's two seventeen, benching over four hundred pounds, um, like raw. But 
um, his squad and that now, like after living it for so many years, um, it just wasn't up to par. And he also didn't want to enter that. It was that when the, the dark ages started coming in where it wasn't, it wasn't clean competitions anymore, but, um, he was a bench guy and he knew enough. And, the, and, and this was something that I think with anybody who somebody's older that has kids, um, when it was time for me to train, he kind of showed me the path. Then he stepped away and yeah, gave it to but, somebody else. Yeah. So I cool. he he had some exposed friends you that to it, but. yeah exposed me to it. And then when it was time for a bigger commitment, uh, two friends of his, two coworkers of his, with that that were successful powerlifters. One guy, Leon, who was 198 soaking wet, had uh, a 765 deadlift, um, and 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 the other guy. Um, he, I mean, his squat, it was through the roof. I think at that point I was squatting like in the mid fours or maybe, maybe I hit 495 for yeah, a sure. rep of two and I'm like 17 years old or something. And he, and he's, he's warming up with weights like that. Sure. Like, I don't even know what, you know, but they also used to run meets and we'd help with loading in the meets, which was a crazy thing that happened when this kid using those old big collars. And yeah, he never tightened it up. Oh, so as someone's coming up, the weights are falling uh, off the side. It was, it was crazy. But I, I moved <laughs> down to, to Long Island from the Syracuse area. Moved down here in 09. Uh, previous to that, played college football. And then got into, you know, like what everyone else gets into. I put on some weight, and then I wanted to get into, like, bodybuilding. Competed for a couple of years. You know, very middle-of-the-pack kind of competitor. Uh, but got in good shape. And then my brother-in-law was competing in strongman. And it was a great group, group of guys, so I did that yeah, for a couple of years, had, and then that, that's great, where we went. We had a great, powerlifting and strongman it, there. It was, it, was, it was a really nice group Yeah, that, that, that gym, and, cool. and also we had people that collected a lot of equipment, you know, so we had, yeah, you know, 800-pound there. tire, 900-pound yeah. tire, we had all the stones, <laughs> you know, I, I, like, so basically when, when we got into it. I remember, funny story about that tire, I remember I flipped it once, and I got it just up, and I just put it back, like, I was yeah. like, I'm done. It was, uh, <laughs> I'm well, done with the, this thing. the funny, the, the one that was closer to 800 pounds, it had it didn't have good grip. Mm. The other one had better grip, but um, it, it was just it was fun. And There's then that's cool when there. you know I was already a practicing therapist for years, but competing and then trying to get more out of my body, mm. I was actually at a little bit of a loss, being like I can't. I have trouble getting down in a squat. Yeah. And I have trouble progressing certain areas, uh, whether it was a strength or, or you know mobility issue. Years and years later, it was probably more of a, because there's really three things that could ever be wrong with the body. You can have something wrong with your tissues, something wrong with your bones, or some kind of stability, motor control, sure. strength, and balance issue. You could obviously have a combination of all of those, but when, when you break all the way down to why something is happening, it's usually one reason that causes other reasons. So um, a few years go by, actually it's probably around the time that after two or three years, we all kind of split from the gym, probably around the time you opened up here, up, up here in Syosset, um, where yeah, first location I started right taking functional movement systems classes, you know, like the, the FMS screen, the medical version, the SFMA, and then just going further with that. Then I had a couple cool opportunities professionally. I worked with the PGA Tour and the LPGA Tour with their feeder tour, the Symmetra Tour, just doing some medical coverage and... Um, and that a lot of business and a lot of a lot of my where I am now has come from things like that. So there's I'm within that that community a bit, and I'm also going to be working at a local golf club part time and build building a business there that's going on like as we speak right right now. And um, and from a from a like an education standpoint, you know, school only brings you so far. Like you you, you yeah. get that and you understand that, and then taking all the extra education and continuing to go, what I was missing was actually like practicing it. Mm -hmm. So I got out of competition for a couple of years and then you had a charity deadlift competition that kind of got everything going again where I was able to just at least, you know, pull semi-respectable numbers, mid five stuffs again. But, um, and then I realized that once I started improving where my actual imbalances were and just, I had someone else take a look at it. Yeah. to where I started addressing some of those stability issues, then all of a sudden I was as strong as I ever was, and I literally didn't do anything else, and a lot of my tissue issues went away. And, I'm, I mean, we're talking, like, daily, like, I have every mobility tool you can th think of here, except for those new Theraguns, um, which are a whole other thing by themselves. But nothing worked until I found the actual problem. So then when I pull myself out, like, 
take myself away as the athlete and then me as, as the clinician or me as the, the coach or whoever I am to, to that person, um, I found a way to, to get very specific and to find out what the problem is and then what's the fastest way. Because I have a very high-functioning, um, high-paced clientele that they don't have time for me to waste like five visits figuring out what's wrong with them. They're like, one session, let's get to know each other. Second session, let's fix the problem. Third session, let's confirm the fix and then go. And then you're on your own. So then if, if, if I'm then managing their, their fitness, I can move them into fitness and then I can transfer them into, you know, ways to, you know, continue to make profit off of that because this is a, a business. So, you know, so there's ways of progressing things that way. But my, you know, my, my philosophy has gotten very, you know, movement based and looking at things as like systems and then kind of looking at a pattern and saying, um, this pattern is, is what I notice when somebody has XYZ knee pain. So then it's like, let me see their squat. Let me see uh, the, them walking. I want to see their, their foot and ankle motion. And then what's the least common denominator on those things. And a lot of times what really ends up becoming uh, the issue is we all we either never learned how to do it or we learned how to do it and then we got lazy and then we don't check off those like the simple boxes anymore. Yeah. And I think sometimes with the, especially with the high level athletes like they're the best compensators. So they'll just figure oh, yeah. out like a way to like get a, they'll they'll figure out a way to move like the weight from point A to point B or they'll figure out a way to do their sports skill. Uh, but they might be doing this like kind of, you know, uh, using a, a kind of a faulty pattern and that could be causing them issues and so they might be really successful in their sport. Yeah. But then they're kind of like broken, you know, uh, one of the things that um, my buddy Jack Evanesh says, you don't want to be kind of like strong and like useless. Yeah. You know, you want to still have that good quality of life. And you well, want to still be like moving well and like all these things. I know, uh, you know, you've helped me personally with like rehab, like uh, my shoulder when I kind of be- I dislocated doing some kettlebell stuff many years ago. Um, and I remember like the orthopedist told me like, they're like, oh, just like don't bench. Like uh, you don't need surgery. Everything was partially torn. I love that. They're like, oh, just don't it's not even an attack like, on orthopedists. That's it's just, just attacking someone personally. It's just like, like it's just and it's, and unfortunately, um, you know, we always try and recommend. We, we say like, you know, doing some sort some form of active recovery is best. And sometimes you do need to push your like threshold a little bit mm-hmm. in order for you to kind of like you know adapt and stuff. If a lot of people, so maybe can you talk about like because a lot of like these uh, clinicians will and, and I understand they want to cover themselves. They'll opt first to say they'll say do nothing and just like completely rest it versus actually doing some sort of like well, there's, movement to kind of fix yeah there's probably the two two reasons for that and this is also me living this as well because i i used to be the guy that put a hot pack on somebody yeah and then and, and then or whatever and uh, gonna, yeah like like it, it would, someone would come in and and an assistant would put a hot pack on them before you even got a chance to say hello to them yeah and sometimes it's even the wrong body part or they just got an injection and halfway through they're yeah. like oh hey what's new oh i got an injection oh shit get the hot pack off of you yeah. Because we want that medicine to stay there, yeah. and then you know you're hey give me ten more reps because I need yeah, you kind of I need another minute forward. or hey do two more minutes on the bike or you talk some just logi- you know it's logistically just yeah it's, to get sometimes working. that's your working conditions, and and it's not as easy. I used to be like when I when I learned the other way or whatever I became you know the, this new funny way of saying it, it's like I became woke c- yeah. kind of idea right that it's not that simple. You know, because I, I work, right now I work client to client, and there's times when things get doubled over, and then someone comes in that, and something's very severe, and now it's like, wait a second, like, how did I manage three people at once when I can only manage a person at a time, you know, but my um, my way of, the, the, the two ways that I think clinicians are looking at things are, um, and, and probably the reason is, what I was mentioning there of not having the time to do it. They don't have the and time and the resources yeah, so, to really yeah, so the they're, you know, right like I, I own my own place. I'm my own boss. I can take as much time as I want. I can schedule however I want. I want to, you know, some people yeah. I schedule my hour and you, a half. You have a lot more control. Yeah, so like I can I control a lot of that stuff, but I've also created that world, and I've also had to, it's been tough creating that world as well because, you know, in the beginning when money wasn't flowing in as much, then you look and go, shit, I spent an hour and a half with someone who's paying a 30-minute rate, and then what if the next person behind that's only getting an hour, what if they talk and then they're like, wow, he spends an hour and a half with you, he only spends an hour with me. Like I was also running the risk of people discussing with each other. And that happens with, you know, with people that have, from a financial standpoint, like if there's any business owners and you give people deals and or you, 
you know, you grandfather rates that when someone else that, that they're, you know, recommending, you know, you just have a discussion on how much it costs and then all of a sudden they're paying a $50 more a session rate because of whatever, you know, you, you run into that every once in a while. But um, going back to, to the initial, because I'll, I'll go for like 45 minutes in the wrong direction. Um, I think, I think therapists don't have enough experience themselves mm. with, you know, the proper way of like, should I load something? Should I not load something? Yeah. Like the squat being a thing of where, um, if you're going to, you say, don't do this. So we had a mutual client that was told to not, to not bend their knee past 45 degrees. Yes. Which could be very warranted <laughs> in, yes, in so certain man. kneecap things. So then if you know how the kneecap sits in a certain poles of the kneecap as the knee bends, there there are areas that, that compress against the femur sure. at certain... But then we're also saying, okay, well, is this somebody who's very knee-driven right. right. with the motion versus hip-driven? Is this somebody that, um, right. like, this was a female yeah, who sits down when she goes to the sure. bathroom? Like, there's some things that are just impossible. And, yeah, and when we're, when we're talking about something like a... When it's a compound movement and... You know, maybe there's 45 degrees, you know, if someone's, like, really bent over or, like, really have a lot of hip flexion, there's so many different yeah. other variables, you know. Um, like I said, like, in the, say the case of a squat, for example, like, are they really, like, do they have a really angled tibia versus more of a vert vertical tibia? Oh, their hips. I mean, there's so many uh So it's, so it's what I've realized, and then I'll, I'll go back to the other thing, what I've realized is everybody's, like, a one of one. I found this out with my personal nutrition you know, gaining and losing a hundred pounds more than once, and 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 you know, and having issues with what I think are um, what I thought was like, oh, I thought I had an issue with red meat, and then it was like maybe I just had spoiled meat, or or I thought I had an issue with like sugar causing inflammation, or it was like, hey, maybe don't sit on the couch for eight hours on Sunday and get up and move, and then all of a sudden you feel better, or hey, let's let's do a little bit of cardio that's not so intense. Yeah. You know, there's this thing about going all in six days a week, double sessions, let's go, let's go, let's go. But I, I think the, the biggest issue, going back to the original, the, the biggest issue when it comes to like what to do when a clinician has an athlete is they never live through it themselves. And so they never experience. And then chances are, if you're someone, you know, me, I'm in my mid-30s, I live through just don't tell anybody about it because you're not going to play and then just suck it up. You know, yeah, if you can keep walking, that's, that's kind of like what we were taught playing football. You know, I played football and wrestling myself, um, not at the level that you did, but uh, you know, and it was it's just uh, it was a different time. And now it's like you know, everyone is uh, if they're not like a hundred and ten percent, you know, sometimes they're kind of worried about like taking a week off and all this stuff. And you know, people are afraid to overtrain. And and I think there's a balance. There's like definitely a middle ground with that. Um, but I guess uh, maybe you know. If, if someone's maybe watching this, uh, maybe uh, they are, maybe they have like, you know, so like with powerlifting, maybe they have like a little bicep tendonitis or maybe their back's a little sore or whatever the case may be. Uh, if something's maybe not like feeling 100%, um, you know, and they're not really sure like where, if they should like kind of take off or if they should just maybe, you know, just drop the weight. Uh, what are some kind of general recommendations? I know like for me, like sometimes like I'll tell people like if the pain is like obviously start to increase if you're doing a certain exercise it's probably like a red flag that we need to stop or we need to go backwards mm -hmm. but do you have some like general recommendations if someone's kind of working through maybe just some general like bumps and bruises not like a major injury yeah. but maybe something's kind of coming on some general recommendations you can give them for the strategies to make sure they can like regulate their training and kind of keep moving forward yeah so so if we use we'll, we'll use like the specific example of like having a bicep issue so then we, we start to say okay what what are you doing actually for it so it hurts and then are we are we looking at it to see does it hurt when you're actively moving? Right. So so let's say it's hamstring. Does it hurt when you're actively doing something with your hamstring? Same thing with your quad. See, the the back and the glutes start to get because there's so many things there's that, that things they do. So there, yeah. the, you know hamstring and, and bicep might be easier simple sure. examples. Yeah. But so if we take someone with with some kind of you know bicep tendonitis, quote unquote, and and they're they're squat bench deadlifting, then we say well, could you show me your squat bench and deadlift? Like, just show me it. I just want to see your technique. Are you somebody who's, you know, is that the side where you're over under? Right. You know, because I, I can only, if I'm going to go over under, I can only do one direction. So there, there's the potential that my left side might have a different effect on my sure. bicep than my right side kind of thing. Then, you know, how long has this person been training? What's, what's their, their training age? So if you're somebody who's new, 
you always have this fear of like, oh, time off, I'm going to be behind the eight ball, I'm yeah. not going to be able to get stronger, I have this progressively loaded program. But where sometimes the answer is like, like just unload that area, yeah, back, stop, back st- stop loading it. And then, then we start to think, okay, if we're using a bicep as an example, uh, with something from a bench standpoint, when you're pushing, are you controlling the entire push? Um, I, I've done some like high rep explosive stuff, like using something like the slingshot or that, where, you know, you could bang 50 reps out with two and a quarter or something, just go, 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 go. And then I found that that would, you know, I'm doing a tricep and chest and shoulder kind of motion, but it actually strained my bicep. So we start to think of the, all the other, the counter activity. So we basically, when someone, when someone comes in with that, I go, just show me your entire program. And then. I believe everyone needs to have skill to do things. So there's skill with a barbell, there's skill squat, there's skill with dumbbells, there's skill with kettlebell work. So then I want to see their skill because there might be little micro contributing sure. factors to that. So if, if you have the tendonitis and it's new, and I there's this anti-ice movement that I don't know where it came from. I don't know if it's just people or want to jump uh, on a train I to think, someone else, I think, but I guess, ice the damn thing and, right, and, right. and wrap it. Yeah. I think the whole thing was, uh, you know, like with the whole ice and, you know, inflammation is part of like the training process. Yes. And I guess there's some, uh, maybe some research where you might uh, potentially like, uh, I guess, limit, limit the some of your adaptation and because the inflammation is going to cause. But my thing is, you know, if it hurts so damn much that you can't train, yeah. and, you know, and ice makes you feel better. You know, and like I said, so I always kind of like say like, because I know like with myself sometimes, like I've been dealing with a little... Uh, uh, it's a little knee issue and it's, it's fine now, but you know, I've, and I've used some ice here and there when it's really swollen, but basically what was happening was I was actually caving on, uh, my right side and I was kind of shifting more weight onto my left leg. And then I started kind of getting a little bit more over like active in my like left hip. Mm-hmm. And then that was causing some knee pain on this side, but which I kind of figured out after watching some videos, but I think going back to what you said, sometimes there's like little like movement things that, you know, they could be very subtle. Cause it's all the other stuff too. Like if, with a specific bicep, issue then we start to think okay let's unload the biceps and you know we'll do some pushing so that pushing could also be straining the tendon and then oh let's do let's do other pulling instead of a deadlift we'll do some kind of horizontal pulling some kind of rowing some you know dead stop row something or you know we'll do more lat driven things with pulling more vertical kind of pulling but you start to look at all those things to be like are people even kind of for lack of a terms like loading properly are they pulling too much through it? So when when yeah. you look at someone's program and you go, because really you can, you can almost you could almost do anything in the gym, and still progress forward. And I mean, I guess it depends on what goal we're progressing what to level, specifically. Yeah, what level yeah. the athlete? Yeah, with the so. level of the person in that. So then when you look at the the development of a program and go, okay, well, all right, maybe I might not put these two exercises together. Or, yeah. You know, how much rest time between? Like I'm I'm big on these like work rest ratios. And what someone's work capacity is, and it, yeah, and it really comes down to what, where are we actually going? So when I start training people, when when I've worked with some professional golfers, they have specific goals of what they're doing, which is really based around them being able to perform when they need to perform. Um, you know, someone who who's competing for a, a, a strongman competition or a powerlifting competition, they just have to peak that day and be healthy, right? Yes. And you're there's going to be bumps and bruises regardless, but. When it comes to management of, of those injuries, we have to look at the big picture and be like, okay, what's the goal? So we have a date for a competition, all right? What's your training up to that competition? Where are you at right now? Have you competed before? Is yeah. this something you could wrap up and just get through the competition and we'll deal with it afterwards? Is this one of those qualification competitions where you got to be? Yeah. Because sometimes what's the priority? two weeks off, 10 days off of load on something in the middle of a cycle could be the best thing that ever happened to them for them to not squat and just move well. Yeah. So the funny part is, is is looking at the bicep and then going, well, what's going on in the rest of the body? And that's where, in the past, I used to lose some people that way because someone would come in for their knee, and then all of a sudden I'm looking at their hip, and then I'm looking at their shoulder, and, the, and then and they're like, how is this interconnected? And I'm, I'm good at putting all the dots together because I'm only going to follow something that actually makes sense. But, you know, someone, as a clinician, you actually got to make their knee feel better. Yes. So, but the other part is, is looking at it and going, if we're looking at you as like a functional human being and there's, and there's an issue here, well, okay, that's your medical issue. But from a functional standpoint, is everything else moving the best that it can? 
so what's a what's a medical problem? What's a fitness problem? Fitness problem is what you can kind of work on in the gym and kind of self self treat. You know, ways all this like self myofascial release has been good and bad at the same time because now everything's like a tissue problem that you can just you know you know massage it out and you know whatever you know smash it into all hell and it'll feel better. Where if someone has has a newer injury, an acute injury that's less than two weeks old. You got to go all with all the normal stuff. We're going to activity modify it. Where if you know something that hurts, if we if if you can modify the position. So if it hurts on a deadlift, does it hurt pulling from the floor? Can I put yeah, the can, deadlift can up you, on a rack? Can, can, can I adjust the range of motion? Yeah. Could could we lower the squat. weight and yeah. still get the work capacity yeah. and actually load? Yeah. I think right. Manipulating load, I think, is a big one. Yeah. Um, and I, then and then from there, like range of motion. Yeah. Like okay, if ice is going to numb the area. Maybe use a special bar or something, you know. Yeah, you change, change hand position. So if somebody has issues getting back maybe under maybe a squat. A little wider. Yeah, or, you know, what's during, during a training cycle, would it really hurt somebody who's going to compete as a power lifter to use a safety bar squat or, or, to, yeah. or to, you know, hold something heavy here or rack kettlebells or something? Yeah. No, it's not going to hurt them at sure. all. Sure. I think uh, I, sh- I want to harp on that a little bit too because I think uh, one of the things that uh, has been really popular in the powerlifting community now uh, there's been the pendulum has really swung toward uh, frequency and specificity, and I think there's definitely some obviously you know something like you know the said principle you yeah. want specific you know so I, I use that I use that, that example all the time to kind of buy people into things, but then I also um, I also go well it does not everything has to be the thing right so you know one of the things I think that's been really helpful for me uh, you know a lot of people may not know you know know this that are newer to our you know, our audience stuff, but, you know, coming from this more sports performance background where there's no barbell on the field kind of thing, we're, yeah. and we're training more patterns, and we're training more like, okay, well, we're doing, using certain exercises to kind of build certain, like, qualities, right? Because I could obviously do, like, a box jump or, like, a, a, you know, a clean pull or a hang clean, and I could be accomplishing the same thing, but the right. the, the, the risk and the reward and everything, there's a lot of different variables there. And I think with powerlifting, we get so, a lot of the, what I see in the newer lifters, they get so, like, romantic that I have to use a straight bar, I have to do my competition stance yes. my competition grip um it's and funny. And, uh, and have matching and, and have matching shoes yeah, well and, that's another and thing and <laughs> and match it. Get out of special <laughs> match it everything else gotta get that headband and matches my but my point my is I, I think sometimes you know if you look at something like like ro- jogging and running for example it's a really high you know injury rate and why is it a high injury rate it's, it's a lot of repetitive motion over and over again over same again. pattern so you know, I don't think we kind of apply that enough to lifting, and I think it's okay to like utilize variations, especially strategically. Um, so I just think that's important, and then maybe you can maybe talk about like you know strategically, kind of like I said, we talked about you know adjusting the range of motion. We talked about like hey, like you could like you know drop the load or go unloaded and just practice the skill itself, yeah. which will get a lot of benefit. Right, I'll, I'll jump in right there. Um, not enough people practice skill. So, yeah, you know, which is you, something why we like to utilize something like you know, a lot of people like kind of poo poo on dynamic effort method and stuff. But that's like a great like yeah. doing a low percentage with a, lo- a high number of sets with low number of reps Absolutely. is a great way to practice like your actual well, technique. Well, th- you know, th- th- there's a couple, couple things with that there, too, is you might not know where you're going to fail until you fail. Mm-hmm. So so there, there, there's these two these there's this new thing about everyone hitting PRs and all this stuff all the time in gym, which doesn't make any sense. Or, or they just change the PR to this is my naked knee PR, this is my wide oh. stance PR, this is my, you know, I didn't take <laughs> a shit yet PR, so right? So so, so there's that part of it. Then there's others that say, well, you should never miss a lift during during training. And then it's like, well, you only learn when you fail, right? Yeah. And then and if we're talking, say, something like deadlift where, you know, my, my nemesis was off the floor. From a rack, I could pull 707 reps. But from the floor, pulling get, six was all, yeah. all all hell. But big old fat bands on the side, then all of a sudden I, I, I was an animal because yeah. my back could, could finish the rest of it. But when it comes to, if you were to think, if you just if you were to squat once a week and you were to squat all year, that's 52 squat sessions. So depending on if you're warming up properly, and I, I think that's something that's missing from a lot of people's um, programs is where, they're counting warm-up sets in their total sets mm-hmm. as opposed to saying we're going to do three working sets. You know, let's just say three sets of eight just for yeah. whatever. That as they're working up, like their ramp to that number is, is like part of their work sets as opposed to the, their warm-up sets. But if we if we look, go, go back to the example of, 
you, you squat once a week and you're going to compete and maybe that's how it's programmed and we, which could definitely work but that only gives you 52 chances you know 52 workouts to get better to where let's say you still maintain the squat once a week but on a day I'm doing some kind of push variation I'm getting under the bar and working bar placement and working tensioning and and where do my hands go in okay am I competing on a monolift can I get actually on a monolift because should I bring the bars in so I can go a little bit wider? Well, I have a big power rack where if you go too wide, you're going to pinch your pinkies. Yeah. You know, to all those little things. Little, and, little variables. You know, and it's like where are you going to go and what are you warming up with? You know, like like I said, I have every little tool here so I can get under a band and do all the stuff and do that. But what if that's not where I'm going to compete? So then it's like what do you need to do in order? So it's all those little skills on hand placement, bar placement, bar thickness. You know, you got to have different, you know, different skills to deal with all those things and and if people spent more time whether it's a decrease in load and and we say okay you know say someone's gonna squat 500 pounds as their third lift that that's what they're that's they're goal, shooting for goal, yeah. then 135 185 225 225 is still less than 50 percent what's wrong with working some reps working depth working isometric holds at the bottom doing bottom up coming from pins what's that extra load shouldn't dismantle you to where you can get under a barbell and squat 135 and work on how you're going to tension your upper body during during the squat or treat everything like the competition and whether it's changing different foot placement and i i haven't had good experience with that personally with not being a good so into deadlift like being a better conventional lifter than than a sumo lifter and then from a from a foot position with a squat like i've got one place where i can really excel and i've tried to play around with it to where for me when i still work on on those things it's it's getting the bar set in the right spot it's how i'm going to keep my wrist am i going thumbless am i trying to get my hands around or you know my pinky's not going on the bar you know the different things to where if i do that every other day while i'm training even if it's a day where I'm technically not doing any of that, like that gives me all that extra time, all those extra reps to figure that stuff out. So then when I actually need it, I already have all the, those skills. And from a load standpoint, not everybody responds to every rep scheme in every way. And then That's are true. you training by yourself? You know, I, I was doing some box squats and I had, I had 575 on the bar and I tipped the box backwards by myself and I didn't pull the pins high enough. So I, I, I had to bottom it out and then come from a dead stop. And it was all, I never thought I was going to, and I was not putting that bar down either. I wasn't just going to drop it. So it was the thing to where yeah, to I set this up. I had no safety. I didn't even get it high enough. I was too close to the box. And I know better. And I was by myself. Yeah. Nobody would have been around to say, you can't hear anything in this building, right? So there, there's also the part of where just the, the skill and practice of it and then are you are you a remote client who's training by themselves to where you know you've got this maximum effort and you're going to be under you know you've linked up all these bands and you've never been under it well why don't we get under those bands at a decreased load if that training is on Thursday do that on Tuesday because what ends up happening is that's how those injuries happen it's rare that people get injured during the squat it's it's all the other stuff that lead to it. Like if it's a pelvis tilting when you know I got a pill behind my back, so my pelvis is a tilt backwards kind of thing. But if if we practice that skill of what we need to do during that main lift at other times during the the training cycle, yeah. you're less likely to to actually hurt that um, or create an injury. But you're also creating a motor pattern that now gives you more and more reps. And then the other part that, you know, might sound kind of foo-foo is actually thinking about it. Yeah, like, my big. feet go here, my foot goes there, I lock in, you know, yeah. I, I'm doing this, so I, I mean, I could do this sitting at my desk, and it's like, this is the position that makes me feel the strongest. So that motor plan, so if I'm under the bar, that, that motor plan by itself, it might, you know, it might look kooky, and, uh, you know, people already think powerlifters are crazy anyway, but yeah. tapping into this, there's no different than a PGA Tour player standing on saying, I'm going to do this, or, or an NFL player saying, 
oh, I'm going to check this guy off and go there, and if he steps here, it's all the same stuff, or an Olympian yeah. leaning in into sure. the turns and stuff, where I'm not saying that if you're just competing in a recreational, you know, let's go just have fun community, let's, you know, compete in a powerlifting competition and have fun, but if you're going to put in time, you know, you want to take some stuff serious, but... If you want to get the most um, out of it. Some mental energy and mental thought and extra reps that are at a decreased load are only going to help and not hurt. Assuming that, that they're done correctly. Yes. 